Welcome back, everybody, to the third day of the conference. So we'll kick things off with a unique event. Uh, we have invited one of our speakers, Paso Vardal, for an interview. This will give us an opportunity to learn more about his work and more about his talk. So I'll uh, just introduce Professor Vardal. So Professor Vardal is a professor of philosophy at the University of Leipzig. The subject of systematic work is the nature of human thought and action, philosophy of mind, language, epistemology, moral philosophy, and theory of action. Classical philosophers who have influenced him the most are Aristotle, Thomas Aquinas, Kant, Hegel, Frege, Wittgenstein, and more recently, Anscombe, Gareth Evans, Mike Thompson, and Anders Kjell. His publications include Self Consciousness and Objectivity, An Introduction to Absolute Idealism. Categories of the Temporal, an inquiry into the forms of the finite understanding, and self-consciousness, as well as numerous articles concerning teaching, the good, metaphysics, ontology, and so forth. We're extremely happy that you could uh, join us today and allow us a, a glimpse into your thinking, Professor. Thank you. So the format of this session is going to be uh, in two parts. The first part will be an interview with prepared questions lasting roughly 45 to 60 minutes. And then we'll open up for questions from the audience, both in person and out there in cyberspace. All right. So in your categories of the temporal, you make the case that thought is fundamentally temporal. Here you draw on the philosophies of Aristotle and Kant. You write about how thought is temporal in virtue of predication. Thought is externally temporal in virtue of the bipolar predication tense and how it's internally temporal in virtue of the tripolar predication of aspect. The bipolar predication of tense deals with substance and their state, so how we make sense of changing things outside ourselves. And the tripolar predication of aspect concerns movement, how things or people do something or move towards something, and how this takes on a certain progression. In addition to this, there is the ground of the temporal or the laws of the temporal. The temporal, which you call generic thoughts. Now, these generic thoughts are notably timeless. This last is perhaps the most striking. So I would like to ask a question about that first, and then I will have, I'll have a question about movement. So about generic thoughts, you write, quote, laws of the temporal are not temporal in the way in which what way in which what falls under them is, end quote. So you go on to speak about how laws are not discovered through habit, but are imminent and always already encountered in something's happening. So you, we can mention also that you think laws admit of exceptions, and where one thing follows a certain course, uh, according to its form, this may be interrupted. And the example you give is of a finch doing finch uh, stuff related to their form, but then gets interrupted when they get hit by a hailstorm. The immediate question that comes to mind is, why is the timeless element needed? Why could we not just say that everything is temporal and leave it at that? Yeah, I think I should first say something about the, uh, how I perceive the significance of the endeavor of um, categories of the temporal. Um, it's the... Um, this, this book is, this, is an attempt to uh, display temporality internal to thought as thought. Yeah. This may appear um, wrong-headed from the start because it may appear that thought as thought in its articulation that pertains to it as thought its logical articulation that is, is precisely um, unaffected by the form of, I say you call it, outside one another that time is. Um, and this is how it is comprehended, I think, how thought is comprehended in, in Kant. Time is represented as a form of intuition the logical articulation of thought as thought does not have any, or is, is not as such a consciousness of anything temporal. Mm -hmm. um, in that, I'm 
and the relationship of this endeavor categories of the temporal to Kant is, is, is more difficult to lay out than its relationship to more modern ways of seeking to uh, treat of um, the consciousness of time that is um, ours and that is takes the form of thought of what is in time. So I'll only do that. Uh, if thought as thought uh, is as we're free of any um, temporal determination, then time will be conceived as one of the things that thought may turn to. And thought as thought is neutral or is, is unaffected, as I said, by time. But of course, it may direct itself at what is in time. And thus, um, it may, as part of its content, take up time. That's the idea that I turn my face against in this book. Yeah. The significance of this is, is, is um, again, I'm sorry, um, I will only say something to, to begin with. Articulating its significance is that um, temporality therein, if, if thought as thought, is of the temporal. If the temporality of what is thought is something that characterizes the thought of it as thought, if that is so, then um, um, the very understanding of being is of our internal life. through the idea of time. Uh, so I always at a certain point, vainly thinking that I could call it my book, Time time and Being, and it was just the missing third part of I think as being and time, as you, as you know, it might be aware of that. Um, it, it's um, um, perhaps a bit, uh, just a word on how it may relate to Kant and to Hegel, as I was thinking of it at, at the time anyway, um, the externality of time as a form of intuition to the logical articulation of thought is, I think, in Kant bound up with or part and parcel with the idea that thought as thought is empty and no knowledge at all. Um, and um, receives, as it calls it, pure or transcendental content through its um, self application to the, what's given in the intuition, of course, to, uh, to the form of our intuition. Um, and arguably, this is the way in which, according to Kant, our knowledge is finite. We were speaking yesterday about how finitude of knowledge is well understood. Carmen spoke about this in a very illuminating way, um, where she explained that it is not finite in the sense that it has epistemic limits, by it, which I think she meant it cannot be understood to be finite by, um, to the idea that there is something that by its constitution, it is prevented from knowing. Yeah, that's um, so. Here's a conception of finitude of thought in Kant, which goes through the idea of thought being empty. Yeah, if uh, thought as thought is is temporal, and that I relate that to the idea of its being of something that's given to it, then its finitude is as were, not as were. It's in no it's in no way comprehensible as afflicting it as or as a limit. Yeah. Um, as it is, I think on Kant's concept, what Kant's conception is too. In, um, I, I won't try to expand it anyway. So this this was this this was the significance uh, of this of this entire endeavor, mm -hmm. and I was trying to recover parts of the philosophical tradition, mainly Aristotle. Um, Aristotle's physics, okay, by revealing 
that what he speaks of is not anything known empirically, mm -hmm. but known through a reflection, a self-clarification yeah. of thought as thought, which can only be so if thought as thought is temporal. So a form of predication um, is that through which thought is temporal. So I represent, now I'm coming to a question, sorry, I took a rather large detail. But um, now what is form of, I mean, what is thought as thought? Thought is thought is characterized by its form, by its articulation, by the way in which its elements come together so as to be a thought. Um, and uh, so we, um, we lay out differences in form of thought as differences in forms of predication, predication being nothing other than the way in which something is said of something such that in that something is said. Yeah. Um, and um, the first form of predication I consider is uh, that that is uh, itself a contrast or an opposition. So that, that, that that's a fundamental idea that I want to lay out somewhat. Um, the form of predication through tense is a contrast of is so and was so. And that contrast or opposition is itself the form. That is to say there's no such thing as a form of which these are specifications with respect to their content. Now you could think, well, it's just the form is just something is something. And then what something is may be placed in the present or in the past. In that case, the form would be um, without opposition. That's basically the only form of predication known in predicate logic uh, of our days. And um, then this entails that um, the contrast of time is not part of thought as thought. But a form that is in opposition is actually a hard thing to embrace. <laughs> I think a form that itself contains within itself a contrast or an opposition anyway. So that's tense. And then there is aspect. Yeah. And that's just what your question was about. And this it's it's um um oh <clears throat> contrast of aspect is um the contrast of progressive and perfective aspect of um, did something or have, have done something and, it, uh, and was doing something. When you put the whole thing in the past, it's most clear um, um, that this is a contrast that's got nothing to do with tense. Yeah. Uh, has done A, uh, was doing A. And now we have a present tense statement, is doing A. And the interesting thing is, which was something that exercised Arthur Pryor when he was trying to construct tense logic, that there's no present tense statement that is distinguished from the past tense statement, X did A, only with respect to its tense. And this is just a very, uh, there's a convoluted way of saying that there's no present tense perspective uh, statement. Yeah. Um, but the significance of this is um, that um, aspect is a genuine form of predication, not subsumable under a contrast of tense. And um, now, when we consider this progressive aspect statement, now let's consider it in the present, we see that it's actually rather mesmerizing and um, hard to hard to get one's mind around. I, um, I think um, I myself I, I was sort of overwhelmed at, time, at times by its mysteriousness. Uh, the apple is falling to the ground. The uh, uh, pear tree is blooming. Um, the um, water is uh, in the glass is freezing. All these are progressive judgments. Now, what do they say? How do how do we understand what they say? Now, it's wrong to say that they describe how things are at a moment, because they entail that something has happened. The water is freezing only if something has happened on the way to its having frozen. And the pear tree is blooming only if something has happened that's on the way to its uh, having opened up its um, blossoms. Um, nothing that is at a moment 
can as such contain some things having happened. Now, one might say, well, it's about what has happened, but also looks forward into what will happen. Mainly. So when I say the pear tree is blooming, I so I look. So what do I see? You know, I see the buds as we're having begun to open, and I look forward to it's having opened up. You know, this is anticipatory. You know, so this is how Michael Dummett uh, describes the special form of progressive aspect of going to. It's going to bloom. It's just a special form of his blooming, actually. It's not in, in terms of aspects, the same form. He says it's present tendencies for the future. What is a present tendency? How can in the present be the how can the future be present in the present? Um, is blooming is a present tense statement and says it speaks of the present, it doesn't speak of the future. Actually, it's um, it doesn't speak of the future, which is clear from the fact that. Um, it doesn't make a prediction about what's going to happen. For um, the statement in the progressive aspect present tense is not falsified if what was happening didn't happen. Uh, if um, the water was freezing but never froze, because then I came along with a um, dry blower, I don't know how to call this, uh, and prevented its further freezing, then my statement that it was freezing is not that well falsified. It was freezing, but in fact didn't froze. And that, that's, that's um, if, that wasn't, if there weren't that contrast, there wouldn't be aspect at all. You know, the aspect contrast is precisely opened up by the possibility of the progressive judgments being true, while the corresponding perfective judgment is false. So the, uh, the, uh, this is what makes the movement as well a movement. And it's onto something where, where it's not. Um, so what does it say, actually? It's of the present, but um, it somehow contains the past and it seems to be of the future. But, so, um, one thing to be said of the progressive is that it's something like metabolism. There's a, there's a metabolism of the movement. That's just something Aristotle discusses at a certain point. When something is moving, then it's always different. Yeah. Oh, so let's let just make it easier with the Aristotelian example of movement with respect to space. Um, so let it be that something is falling to the to the ground. And I won't drop this now, but I could, and then it would be falling to the ground at a certain point. And as it is falling, it's being falling. What is that? Well, it's been here. It's been here. It's been here. It's been here. But uh, it's not any sum of those. Um, it's rather, um, it's always different, but therein and in being always different, it is the same, namely falling. Uh, so when I, when I said uh, the um, animal in its metabolism is altered in such a way as to remain the same, and it's being altered is it's remaining the same, that being the general description of metabolism. We could speak of a metabolism of movement. So it contains difference as that in which something is the same. So I, they are, it's, it's, um, so, mm, 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 stunning, stunning form of thought actually. But now I think, or I thought that um, the way in which that sameness is in and through what's always different is in the thought of a rule or in the thought of how things go in general. I took my clue from Kant, a second analogy, where he says, in the perception of what's happening is always present at the rule. And that, um, I think you saw precisely this. You was, uh, there, I'm engaged in interpretation of the second analogy there. I won't turn to that here now, but um, I think the, uh, what, what is the truth in this, in, this, in this argument is that the perception of something's happening, he's actually concerned with that, perception of something's happening, and I've sought to bring out how weird this is, the perception of something's happening. It's a progressive aspect. You can see it throughout the text, and he's very cautious and careful to indicate that progressive aspect is what he's concerned with. The perception 
the 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 perception of something's happening, he says, in that is always present, the rule. And this is the way in which in what is happening, the many things that are also different are understood to be the same and part of the same. Now, this is the anti-empiricism of Kant. Um, anti-empiricism here is the insight that the consciousness of what's given to the senses and therein is uh, temporal is as it were originally uh, through the consciousness of something general. That's to say there is no um, sphere or uh, I don't know, place is foundation of consciousness of the temporal which as yet is free of general understanding, which therefore must be arrived at by a step. That step is then called induction, which induction is kind of completely right in saying that's, that's nonsense. It's no possibility. If you, if you, if you think induction is uh, an inference from a limited number of cases to all cases, and that's not, that's not an operation of reason. It's not. It's not an operation of reason because it's very obvious that you exceed in your conclusion what you're given in the premises. So it's, it's not an inference. It, defies, it contradicts the um, idea of inference. Now, um, what this shows is not that we have no general knowledge, which is in fact the conclusion that every empiricist must draw. And if he doesn't, it's just, it's, it's just fault in his mind. Hume draws this conclusion, of course, so he's not, he's clear. But um, you must assert that there's no such thing as general knowledge. But the only way in which there can be general knowledge is if it isn't arrived at from a self-standing, autonomous, uh, so through its uh, comprehensible through itself layer of knowledge of what's given to the senses as here and, um, as here and now. And this can be seen when we see that the temp that the that one as well as central and fundamental form of temporal consciousness is consciousness of movement. And then we see that as Kant, I think rightly brings out, that that consciousness of movement is as such and already, always already, as I was saying, yeah. oh. always already understanding of something general according to which what is happening is indeed happening. Okay, thank you. You you already made the, uh, your way into the, the area of the mm. second question, mm. which was basically okay. movement. And yeah. So, yeah. I, so I won't okay. ask it. I, I think you basically mm. answered it. Mm. I, I'll just say this: that when you when you spoke about self opposition, yeah, that seems to be already springing in in movement when you have this uh, progression and mm. a moment, uh, mm. which have to have a kind of asymmetrical relationship because. Mm. The movement mm. cannot be a sum of moments, right? And, they, and neither can the movement mm. itself be a complete whole. Right? So there is right. there is this uh, tension between them, and that seems yes. already like in self opposition. Yes, yes, exactly. I mean, uh, I um, I try to explain that the opposition of tense, the contrast of tense, actually, as were presupposes logically, um, the. Um, understanding of movement or the representation of movement through the contrast of aspect. Uh, this is something that also can be found in Aristotle, where he says the unity of the movement and the unity of the substance movement are two sides of a coin. Um, this is to say, if you have a substance of changing states, now that's Kant's first analogy, it's a substance change. Our states are forever changing, <laughs> and the substance is what holds them together, uh, and that is the representation of time um, uh, in experience now this substance as the same holding together the states is only understood as such in the apprehension of the substance as changing and that's now uh, a form of representation that's different from state and substance because it's state and movement it's, it bears the progressive aspect it is changing from a to b and and that is only if we have a form of judgment in which 
as it were, states are perceived, uh, or so, so opposing states are held together as one. And that is formal in movement, right? Only when this opposition is as it were, embraced in one, in one judgment that, that in virtue of its form holds them together, only then is there the unity of substance uh, as were represented in that judgment. And, and thus, uh, as I said, the opposition of things is incipiently movement, but this is something I try to bring out in the progression from the form of judgment that is um, defined by the contrast of tense to the form of judgment that is defined by the, uh, as I say, tripolar contrast. Yeah. Okay, thank, thank you very much. So, since you've been mm. speaking about judgment, we'll, mm. we'll move on to your most recent book, which is mm. Self Consciousness of Objectivity. Yeah, what I like most about this book is the cover. <laughs> It's so fine that people can buy it and put it on a couch table and just have it there as a decoration. <laughs> and uh, not knowing that. Uh, <laughs> Don't need to read it. It's, yeah. just, it's just fine like as it is like, you know, with, through its cover. <laughs> <laughs> and you argue in this book that objectivity considered apart from its being known so is untenable. And that instead objectivity is knowledge of the first person character such that objective knowledge is in effect self-knowledge. As you write in the book, quote, thought precisely because it is objective, thinks nothing but itself. We need to understand how judgment can be the knowledge of what is in such a way precise that precisely as knowledge of what is, is nothing other than self-knowledge or knowledge knowing itself. And you call this formula, the, and you call this the formula of absolute idealism. Uh, and it echoes Hegel's assertion from the Phenomenology of Spirit, paragraph 230, that reason is the certainty of consciousness of being all reality. And the book targets various positions that posit a separation between objectivity and thought, between a judgment's validity as uh, something separate from the act of the mind, and even the ultimate old dichotomy between world and mind. A centerpiece of the book is, of course, self-consciousness, which, if it's accurate to say, provides its own validity, indeed the objective validity. And it can be seen to sustain itself in giving itself to itself. And he writes strikingly, and I quote here at length, the first thing known in the science of judgment, the first thing known in self-consciousness is self-consciousness. Self-consciousness is known in and only in self-consciousness. Self-consciousness is its own science. There is no such thing as a theory of self-consciousness, much less are there competing theories of self-consciousness. If a theory of knowledge of something that is and is as it is independently of being known in that theory. It is a traditional thought that philosophy cannot propose hypotheses, cannot make assumptions, can only say what thought, what is thought together with its own, own unconditional necessity. Wherever this idea is propounded, philosophy is understood to be a science without contrary. It is understood to be the science of judgment, the science of self-consciousness, or simply self-consciousness. So the first, the first, like one could say that the first thing known in self-consciousness is not self-consciousness, but, you know, sensuous matter, the, the world out there, the things around us. This seems to be like the most immediate and most obvious, so one could say. So would you contest this, or would you mean that uh, or do you mean that it is specifically in the science of judgment that self-consciousness must be known first? So when we're engaging in, in philosophizing that, this becomes clear. And if you could say something about this, you know, why there cannot be a theory about self-consciousness, because you certainly have neuroscientists who are, who are trying very hard to do that, uh, and yet you call it science. So if you could elaborate a bit. Uh, I call this science um, using the term in the sense of uh, the German Wissenschaft. Yeah. And um, I suppose perhaps also the Greek, Greek epistemi. Um, so this doesn't, um, so I don't want to allow the term science to be confined to a science of nature. Nature, I understand to be the totality of uh, what is known uh, in such a way uh, that uh, it's, uh, it is as it is known to be, independently of being known to be so, which I also understand to be a, a nominal definition of theoretical knowledge. And so the, uh, the 
to say that um, there's no theory of self-consciousness just means that self-consciousness is no object of theoretical knowledge. Yeah. It's also no object of practical knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> you can see that as well. But now, um, one may think and, um, that um, there is such a thing as thought. After all, there are like, these creatures around here, and what they have is a capacity for thought. They think you know, somehow inserted in them, that's found in them, capacity. And, um, um, we, uh, and they have that in the way in which they have a, a heart. I mean, of course, it's more, some are more complicated, perhaps, and, but still, somehow, it's found in them in the way in which the heart is found in them. And then, and just as there is a scientific investigation of what the heart is doing and how, um, there should be a, a corresponding investigation of um, how thought works, you know, how, how it functions, you know. Um, and one may think, well, yes, one thing we need to inquire is whether thought is self-conscious. That is to say, whether um, in thinking, the one who thinks is conscious of thinking what therein she thinks. We need to find out. And then we may have the hypothesis. I, I think it's self-conscious. And, and there's just, and there's someone else says, oh, no. I disagree. Um, I remember this talk I gave. And I said thought was, thought was self-conscious. That was indeed a neuroscientist and said, I disagree. What did you say? I. <laughs> anyway, so uh, um, I said, no, you don't. <laughs> um, but um, now this is what I reject. I reject um, the idea that thought is um, um, comprehensible as something to be known as a given object. Um, and this insight itself uh, is nothing other than an articulation of the self-consciousness of thought. Now, why? What does self-consciousness of thought mean? It means, or what I mean by it, um, is, um, as I just put it, thinking something is understanding oneself to think what therein one thinks. Now, the therein is a, a term that does indicate the internality of the understanding I've been describing to that which it understands. It's not being other. So the self-consciousness of thought, for example, does precisely not mean something. I don't know, there are people here read Williamson. But there is a, there's a discussion about whether KP, um, sorry, this is K is to be an operator attached to the sentence P indicating that P is known or someone knows it. KP implies KKP. Um, now this is denied by various people. Um, um, that's all, the thought of self-consciousness doesn't mean that um, I think P entails that I think that I think P, it means that um, what is thought in thinking something is none other than what is thought in thinking oneself to think it. That's to say the I think doesn't um, uh, introduce any further content into, in addition to what is thought when one, when one understands oneself to think it. Well, now, if thinking is understanding oneself to think it, then how is that known? It's not known about thought, it's known in thinking. Uh, there, and indeed, there's no other way to know this. So the, um, the point um, of this quote is that there is no way to, as we well, embrace thought and there in its self-consciousness from outside it. This is, I, I think actually that I would hold this in with complete generality and that, and that will um, make people feel dizzy. Um, but um, um, I do um, 
there is no thinking thought otherwise than in thinking what this thought thinks. You know, there, there, there's no thinking thought from there. Thought as such is a, a last word. You know, you know, you know the definition of the last word by Tom Nagel. So I'm almost quitting Thomas Nagel, but he is he is quite he is so superior. So in this book, the last word, he defines the last word as something that can only be said or spoken as a word, intentione recta, which cannot be sort of bracketed and made itself the same way the topic. Yeah, where in, um, the last word is something that allows no out, sorry, outside perspective on it. And so what I there say is simply a way of saying that thought is last. Thought is the last to itself. I mean, thought is, uh, this is not the same one Nagel says. He says he thinks there are some thoughts that are not last, but then there are last. Actually, it says words. It's, it's interesting that he says words and not thoughts. Anyway, I won't, I won't speak about that. But, but um, he thinks some thoughts are last and some aren't. Um, for example, he thinks logical insight is a last thought. That's to say, there's no way of thematizing it from outside itself, you know, without thinking it straight. He thinks certain ethical thoughts, thoughts about the good, are last. There's, a, there, there's no way to make the thinking of it a topic from outside that very thinking. You know, I, I think he's right about that, but he's right about that because thought as such is last. I'm, 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 I'm thinking. Yeah, so uh, that's the significance of saying there's no theory of it. Uh, and um, so that's um, one, one further way to, to say this. If, if one, sorry, sorry. analytic epistemology for, uh, presents its theme as um, through, the, through the statement, subject S knows that P. And I ask the question, what are the conditions under which it's correct to say of some S that she knows P. Now that is not the topic of epistemology. And the topic of epistemology is correctly indicated by Kant by the question, what can I know? Now, this is a first person question. This question cannot be answered except by an articulation of knowledge that is such that in knowing something as understood through this articulation, one knows that one does. For if it weren't, so uh, um, if it didn't have this form, it would not constitute an answer to the question, what can I know? It, kind of, it couldn't be put in the first person. And if I if ask the question, what can I know? An answer to this question must reveal what I thus can know to be known in such a way as to be known to be known in that very knowledge. So this means that epistemology or the reflection on knowledge that philosophy is, is such that it speaks the understanding of knowledge that someone has who knows and in so knowing. In that way, it's not a theory. It's not a theory of knowledge, but it's, so it, it can't be understood otherwise than as bringing out into the open what she who knows already knows understanding herself to know, saying, I know. <laughs> so so uh, this, this is the, uh, the understanding that philosophy seeks. Um, and, and this is the understanding that marks it out as philosophical, precisely in being not a theory. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, sorry, did I lose my, 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 my track, my orientation? Or is it no, 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 the question? Did I, did I speak to the question? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, it, you use the phrase several times in the categories of the temporal uh, from Wittgenstein, uh, logic looks, uh, looks after itself. It's yeah, this right. is an answer. Uh, yeah, right. I mean, um, so I, I, I actually, as, uh, to me, it's, it's, it's always been a major, um, um, I, I mean, the, the central, so I, I well, I want to speak about it myself, but I, I, I think this, this, is a, this is a peculiar character of philosophy that there is, actually, it's another instance of what you said in this quote that you, that you read. It's a peculiar instance of 
philosophy that there is no meta philosophy. Mm. There's no agenda in meta philosophy. This doesn't exist. And, and the, it doesn't exist because there is no way to articulate philosophical insight without therein understanding its character as philosophical insight. So there is no bit of philosophy that is not better philosophy. <laughs> there's a, there's a, there, um, and therefore, there's collapse. Uh, I have always, so my, um, I want to uh, clarify to myself um, how I can present what I do as philosophical comprehension, or at least aiming at philosophical comprehension. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, and I, I um, think I find an answer to this question in the peculiar character of anything that qualifies as a philosophical concept, mm -hmm. as a distinctive that lies within the authority of philosophy, where philosophy is the one, is the science that is, yeah, is has the authority to speak on that concept. Like, um, um, when Aristotle introduces that science, I spoke of it yesterday, he was on to speak about the law of non-contradiction. And he in effect defines the philosopher as the one who has the authority to pronounce, to declare the law of non-contradiction. Why? Because the law of non-contradiction is the law of being what is insofar as it is and that's the philosophy and nobody has the physicist is not he's he's he can't he doesn't have the power to speak to declare to pronounce the law of non-contradiction that's the one who speaks the law of non-contradiction he she is the philosopher um now this must be shown of all philosophical concepts that that we deploy and i think uh, well, that's my take. So um, I think of philosophy completely differently from those who think, oh, well, there are many things around in this world. I can do philosophy about all of them. Uh, for example, there's perception. Why? So I, I could, no. and let's turn my philosophical acumen to that topic. Uh, I'm going to do some philosophy of perception. Well, uh, actually, there is there's this thing, there's ignorance. Now, I'm going to do now philosophy of ignorance. That's very, that's very popular at the moment I've, I've heard. Um, so now, um, and then philosophy is limitless just because, weirdly, it can be turned to anything whatsoever. Like <laughs> all the other sciences, they must have stuck with one topic, but philosophy can be done by it. It's, it's, uh, I think that's a parody. Um, but um, I think it's how often it's, it's understood. Uh, then, of course, it's possible to have a meta-philosophy. If you think of it in this way, then, then it makes a lot of sense to think, oh, well, now I must uh, think about you know, what it is that makes it philosophy that I do, um, as opposed to some other thing, um, some other science. Yeah, because obviously all these things are also possibly the object of some science, you know, perception. Yeah. Some scientists, you know, I do a philosophy of it. Uh, how is what I do a philosophy? And now I have got my meta philosophy, which is a further thing. This a different, distinct from. It's not already done in my doing the philosophy of perception. Yeah. Uh, now, this entire way of thinking falls away when we place this limitation, when we put ourselves under the obligation to make clear how it is that the concepts that we use in philosophy lie within the authority of philosophy and that that is so sort of that through which we articulate them. And um, I think all of the concepts are those that bears where the character that I yesterday sort of brought out is born by the concept of being, as being universal, as being not a determinate concept. Uh, are not concept about, about this as opposed to that, uh, but are as well ways of thinking. Um, I think this um, is, I mean, it's evident in, uh, of concepts like substance, um, but now, this is the task. Um, is it true about the concept of a human being? I say yes, but uh, people say no. Um, or is it true about the concept of state? Is it true about the concept of promise? Is it true about the concept of um, 
language. I say yes, but um, this is <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to defend any of this now, but I, 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 I want to uh, describe the orientation with which I approach any of these. It's, it's a, if I am to think about them at all, I need to understand how it is that I that they lie within the form of that, that they are internal to the kind of activity that um, is philosophy, which is not a theory, is never a theory, but is always and everywhere absolute knowledge. So, right? anyway, it's, it's the articulation of what is understood through itself. Mm -hmm. And that is to say, uh, self-consciousness. Okay, thank you. I have one more question, mm -hmm. and then we will open it up. So given that we're now speaking about the concepts that are pertaining to philosophical examination, in, your, in a recent article uh, you titled Freedom as Right, you draw on Fichte to show how freedom is a dyadic self-conscious relationship. Yeah. And, and what's key here, if I understand correctly, is that one's freedom is achieved through another's, but that this nonetheless is a single activity. If, like it forms a nexus, and the nexus of this freedom is it's called right. Now, freedom as such is not a given determination, you know, like the color of my waistcoat, uh, my shirt, and yeah. so on, right? But it's the self determination of self consciousness. Yeah. And then the question is, as you yourself also posed in the article, mm -hmm. how do I know you are free? Mm. If your self consciousness, the self determination cannot, by definition, mm. be given. Right? Yeah. The logic here is not something alien to us, since it is presupposed in everyday examples and in like the one you use, like I am giving you an apple, right? As you, and, an apple. yeah, mm -hmm. and as as you write, quote, and as long as I do not know you to be free, I cannot attach a dyadic self conscious determination to you and me. I cannot give you an apple. And, mm. So. Would you like to tell us a bit about, yeah. about this without, a, without us collapsing it into the, the given? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So it, it's, um, it's very widespread and not only in, in philosophers who um, um, belong to the broadly speaking psychologistic uh, form of philosophizing to think of self consciousness as a broadly speaking ideologically a property of uh, certain kinds of beings. Actually, if, the, if that were so, it would there would have to be a theory of it, <laughs> um, and then uh, so I could try to give one and say actually. So it's a condition for someone to have this property that someone else does something to her. And actually that guy must also be self-conscious, must have the same property. In there. And, 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 but, and the whole discourse is now organized around this logical uh, form of uh, saying of someone that he's got a certain, uh, that she's got a certain property, is yeah, self-conscious. Yeah. Um, now, um, In that case, it, it would also be uh, open to request empirical criteria for someone to be self-conscious. When we do the mirror test, right? check. On the, on the, the cat fails the mirror test, but certain corbid birds, yeah, is that the right term? Uh, crowds and things, they, 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 they pass it. Mm -hmm. They must be self-conscious. Yeah. This is, this is this is how the terms in English now. Oh, um, Fichte uh, um, has uh, it's very clear that this, uh, this is this is not the this is this is this confused. Uh, um, so I um, I think um, that self consciousness should be in 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 the first instance. Presented in this way, it's a it's a character uh, of a determination that is such that um, exhibiting this determination is the same as understanding oneself to do so. So it's it describes self consciousness. The term self, the prefix self indicates the internality of the consciousness that's so indicated 
to that of which it is the consciousness. And that way it is self-consciousness, it's not consciousness of a, of a self. Uh, now, when we think of it in this way, we can um, as we're begin to, uh, we, we have an opening into understanding what, for example, is meant by universal self-consciousness. I first go there and then come to the mm, dyadic self-consciousness. Universal self-consciousness is a term that readers of Kant will know. What is universal self-consciousness? You can understand it from the introduction of the, of the, of the idea of a practical law in the beginning of uh, the critique of practical reason. Um, there he says, uh, and I don't know whether I do this word by word, but correctly, but he says that a practical law is one that it is that is known to hold generally, while a max uh, like um, a maxim that is not that is um, not a law. Yes, sorry, I don't know the terms, but it's under, understood um, to be valid only of her, yeah, whose maxim this is. Has, has it really, does anyone have this? Yeah, I could read it anywhere. No, no. If someone has it, just you know, read it, help me, help me out. Um, but the point is, in, in making this distinction, um, he doesn't distinguish law from the subjective maxim simply by saying the one holds of everyone and the other holds of only one, he says it's known to, work, to hold of everyone. Yeah. Um, now, and so it's, it's internal to the practical law as the law that it is, that it is known and is known generally. That is to say, there is no such thing as knowing the, the, the a practical law without therein knowing it to be known by everyone. It's obvious that this is uh, crucial to its being a practical law because a practical law is one that's followed only through the understanding of it as the law of uh, the action that conforms to it. Uh, and so a practical law can be universal only by being known universally. Um, it's also clear that it wouldn't be a practical law if I could raise the question, I could, so, of this practical law, and I said, no. I find this practical law, this is, this is, my, how about you? Uh, is that your, your law too? Do you know that law? And if you know, now, well, now I have no idea of it. Um, that's, that would show that it's not a practical law. It's practical law when I know, in knowing the law, everyone to know it. Nothing in addition to knowing the law is needed in order for me to know everyone to know it. No step is needed from my knowing the law to my knowing everyone to know, to know it. And that shows that um, that which is that the, as it were, subject of the knowledge is as universal as the law that is known in that knowledge. The law is concerns everyone, that's its objective universality. It's known by everyone that it's subjective universality. This is the way Stephen Engstrom presents it, super, in his superb book, superior book, um, The Form of Practical Knowledge. So there's subjective and objective universality, but these are the same. That's to say, it's being valid of everyone is nothing other than it's being known to be so valid by everyone, which is what I think is already brought out in the very first introduction of the very idea of practical law in that first um, uh, paragraph of uh, the Greek practical reason. Um, so um, now this is how I think Kant understands us to know each other to be free. This is, this is the way in which Patricia Kitcher, I think, has sought to explain it as well. How do I know others to be free? It's clear that it's not empirically given because every empirically given is as such understandable and comprehended through the forms of experience um, and thus um, not understood to be free. How do I know anyone to be free? She says, and I think that's the answer I can, must give, I know it simply in knowing the moral law. Now, uh, this has a difficulty, though, because there is in the moral law, in fact, no representation of other people at all. There is no idea of a, 
differentiation of the as a universal subject uh, of that general law into many. Kant pretends that there is, but actually this differentiation by his, by his own lights is given from outside that law. He states, uh, my, 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 my point is, I think I make it in this article that the formula of humanity, which all of the sudden brings in other people, brings in something that one would not have as or have any thought of in just thought of the moral law. Um, so they really appear as something given, but it can't be. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's, there's, I think, a problem in Kant's moral philosophy, <laughs> clearly uh, visible here, that um, even while the moral law is um, only uh, a practical law, if it is that through which I understand others, there's, no, there's nothing in the moral law to provide any, any idea of the difference of myself from others. It's just the sameness. No negativity here, right? But so now Fichte has, I think, this this really, um, yeah, this this is an insight that um, the uh, fundamental form of or anyway, a underivable fundamental form of practical thought is bipolar. That's to say, is the thought of me to you has an I you. It's not an I thought, it's not self quantity. So I use the term, I think, well, I know whether that's the paper, I think in another, I call it one another consciousness. That's, that's a term that's, that's uh, formed in analogy to self consciousness. One another consciousness is a foremost linguistic expression is I give an apple to you. Yeah, and we can see, I think that this is a thought, the thinking of which is such that I therein understand you to think the same thought. Mm -hmm. So what we had with respect to universality of the practical law, namely the universality of the law is the same as the universality of the subject of the knowledge of the law, now uh, uh, can be found here too with respect to the bi bipolar character. That is to say, the thought being bipolar is nothing other than it's being known to be so, and thus in one knowledge. Mm -hmm. So that is why Fichte calls it, I think he does call it, a thought for two. Uh, it's um, a thought that has, as it were, two, as it were, <laughs> thought by two thinkers, not together, but against one another. Right? So, so it's a thought, therefore, that not just has two subjects, but has the difference, indeed, as Fischer says, opposition of the subjects internal to its form. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, he makes the point, I'm, I'm not going to go through this argument here, but he makes the point that this is fundamental to, um, uh, to um, self-consciousness as such. That is to say, there is no constitution of I thought, um, except as the thought of that which is thought uh, in this bipolar fashion, I you. This is a thought later repeated by Martin Huber in his, in his famous book, I you, where he speaks of the Grundworte, uh, he calls it Worte, again, interesting. But um, I you, um, I is never spoken alone. He says, I is spoken together. It's, it's one word. I you is one word. It's a Grundwort. It's a foundational word, I, you, but it's one word. It's not two words, it's one word. I mean, by that, he makes the same point as Fichte does. This is a one inseparable thought that not two, two components coming together as well through an external synthesis. Synthesis, <laughs> one as what originally unified bipolar thought that holds the two apart from each other. Mm -hmm. yeah? And um, this is a very different fashion of, uh, or, um, I want to contrast this again with this way of thinking of self-consciousness where I say, okay, this is a property of me. Now, what's my, what must happen so that I have this property? Well, there must be some uh, impulse from the outside. I must be called it. This is a way of reading I must be, I must be called uh, upon, I must be summoned. Um, and, then, and then we're going to be self-conscious. So, and that now is very deep dependent of myself and others because I wouldn't be self-conscious if it weren't for them. Actually, it goes much deeper. 
Mm -hmm. It means that there is no such thing as someone's being self-conscious. But what there is, is a form of being which is the as a universal understanding of each as related to the other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that is what self-consciousness is, Christoph uh, argues, I think, in this ex Yeah. Um. Okay, thank you. We will now open up for questions from the audience. Yes. Uh, first question is from Stephen. Stephen, please remember you're ready. You want to put on the big. Uh, yes. Good morning, and thank you both of you. That was um, quite fascinating. So thanks very much uh, to Philip for the questions and for your very illuminating answers, Sebastian. Um, what I really want to try and do is just clarify, and this is going to sound a little bit self-serving, and I'm sorry about this, but clarify in a sense where we overlap and where we might differ um and just uh, just on on our overlap i agree with you completely when you say philosophy is not a, you know a theory about an object and i think if i've written down correctly what you said you said philosoph philosophy is the the articulation of what is understood through itself and i thought yes absolutely that that is very very beautifully expressed and and i agree with that um, but one thing that strikes me as being a possible point of difference is the the fact and forgive me if I'm not putting this quite rightly but that that, that you you put self-consciousness as it were at, at the sort of beginning uh, and another way of putting it is that in a way you're understanding thought to be equivalent to thinking um, and this might this might uh, indicate a, a subtle difference between the way that, that you're presenting it and the way I'm understanding uh, thought, obviously through Hegel, uh, 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 largely. Um, as I understand it, thought can have two aspects to it. It can, it can be understood as thinking, certainly, but it can also be understood as logos, as, as rationality at the heart of being, uh, to put it in a rather crude sense, as that which would still be there even if there were no self-consciousnesses in the universe. Now, my understanding is that 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 uh, yes at some level hegel is following uh, kant and fichte in in understanding there to be an ineliminable element of reflexivity in thinking but what's striking about the logic is that it begins with a kind of collapse of thought into being where there doesn't seem to be a place for self-consciousness yes we know that we're doing the thinking, but that's not what's being thematized. What's being thematized is thought as being. And as we move through the logic, what is striking is the sense that th this thought, which is much more akin to logos in a sense, has to show itself to be self-conscious. And so we get at the end of the logic, die sich wissen der Wahrheit. This Thought as Wahrheit, as, as Sein, as Logos, proves to be self-consciousness. Um, perhaps just in a logical sense, and then of course it comes uh, uh, into fruition in the philosophy of spirit. So then, if that's right, the Hegelian view seems to be, in contrast maybe to, to Kant and Fichte, and maybe to you, um, that, that, that philosophy articulates what thought is understood as being logos rationality that then becomes self-conscious and it becomes self-conscious in beings like us so that in a sense we are just the self-consciousness that being has of itself now i just wondered if you could say and i'm the minute i'm not so concerned about who's who's right or who's wrong but yeah. whether that is an appropriate way to think of how we might agree and differ, or whether I've just got the story all wrong. Um, I am not um, able, I think, to um, um, see clearly whether we differ or not. Um, you began by saying one um, can uh, approach thought as, or in the 
guise of or whatever thinking for as logos. Um, and that was to be the point of divergence, possibly. I was, if I yeah, right. possibly. I, I approach it in the first manner, and you would think that the first and original other word, conception of it is as logos, which then may, through its complete articulation, um, yield an understanding of itself as being self-conscious in this very understanding of it. Yes, that's <laughs> yeah. right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, um, I, I, I don't, actually, I, I'm rather confident that, that I don't disagree with that. Um, I, um, I don't know that I would put it as a, as a, as a choice between options, really, and I think you wouldn't either, because you think one option is the right one. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, um, I mean, I am, um, perhaps we would, yeah, we would, not perhaps, we would be able to um, make progress with this by really discussing the, at the beginning of the logic. I've always been impressed by the one, I think, Anmerkung, Vierte Anmerkung, I think it is, where uh, um, he um, describes the, uh, uh, the, the thought or the, I don't know, what's, what's expressed uh, by being as um, historically first in Parmenides, um, who embraced that as thought embracing itself in its absolute abstraction. So, um, that was very illuminating to me. <laughs> I mean, if I think about what is thought in thought, um, where I do not, where uh, well, that which is thought by thought through thought itself, as were in which thought embraces itself, therefore, and in its uh, and thought is this absolute abstraction. I mean, that's original to it that it is that it is it, uh, well, the absolute abstraction is that embracing itself, the original embracing itself is being. That is, is so. If I if I um, try to bring to language, find a term in which I express that which is, as it were, uh, thought in thought as such. Then I will say it is. So that that's how I understand the. So it, we can say now it is that's logos, yeah. But but um, this doesn't, um, it, yeah. Right, right, good. And and this is validated as we're well through this, or or um, well, uh, yeah, of through its being, uh, what Hegel describes it as being, namely thoughts embracing itself in its absolute abstraction. Um, in that thought. Um, the as were well, opposition of thinking and being and their identity is not itself articulated and in that way uh we are in at the very beginning we are not in the in the logic of the concept and so um the unfolding of um that as were well, original um the thought in which thought embraces itself in its absolute abstraction is one in which this um Opposition, the understanding of knowledge through itself and its relation to being is finally achieved as we're in the absolute idea. And then, yeah, I, so I, um, right, okay, well, I, I hope possibly, I hope that this may not be too much at odds with how you under, understand the logic. I, I, um, I perhaps should also say that the way in which I proceed often is um, and that may uh, cause the impression that there's a major difference is that I take up certain, the way in which um, such, in which certain barriers to understanding in uh, the contemporary debate, I was called upon by Edmund to confess that I'm bound to that debate. And I was a 
put it better on my table. Now, the way in which I engage those issues is through uh, the reflection on barriers uh, to understanding in certain areas, for example, in epistemology. And so I go immediately there. Or the way in which they arise in um, the discussion of um, uh, the principle of right, for example. In the, um, and so I go immediately there. Uh, this is unsystematic and it's uh, therefore not revelatory of um, the um, um, as were proper articulation of the kind of comprehension of which it is an element or through which it is ultimately understandable itself. Um, I, that, that's, an, that's a question that I'm unclear about whether this is uh, how, how to think of this. I'm actually inclined to think, and you may disagree there, I, possibly, I'm inclined to think that, um, precise, uh, sorry, uh, no, this is too vague now, but I'm in, inclined to think that in a, it is possible to, as it were, to, to, to bring to articulation the form of under, understanding um, that's provided um, through philosophical reflection as it were locally. I do recognize that this, this, this form of exposition in, in, a, in a system is, uh, it, but I, yeah, it, so it's, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm now, I'm actually out of my, I'm out of my depth. Um, I am um, not in the clear about, um, how how to think about systematicity in philosophy. Um, I'm not clear about that. I have the inclination to think that a certain way of thinking of it um, is misguided, which is very bluntly put to say that this is the way in which my former colleague Wolfgang Gott put it. He said the system is the minimal unit of philosophical uh, uh, speech, <laughs> the minimal philosophical speech act. So, uh, so th this, is, this is a way to um, uh, pronounce the, uh, or, or to understand the systematicity of philosophical thought, that you have said nothing. Well, that's our concept at a certain point. You've said nothing unless you've said everything. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure whether this this is this correct. I'm also not sure whether this is what Hegel would think. That's not so important in the first question, of course. But I'm actually unclear about this, and therefore I'm unclear about the significance that may be attached or not to my proceeding as I do, in a certain way locally, often here and there. Yeah, you know, without starting at being. Going through the launching the by real philosophy, right? So um, that may be. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That's 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 extremely helpful, Sebastian. That's very and actually those last remarks you made were very illuminating. Um, and 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 so it may just be actually one of the differences between us a matter of um, a procedure actually in some ways. Um, I mean, I obviously I've got to let other people come in, but but just to give you an indication of where I stand, you might be interested to know that when I'm not teaching Hegel my favorite choice is Spinoza. <laughs> so, so I tend to teach a lot of Spinoza, which obviously again is, is very systematic. But um, anyway, thanks very much. That was really very illuminating. So I'll, I'll yield to the next person. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, but, um, I would have a quick question, or maybe a kind of clarification. So when you talk about the absolute knowledge, like the self-consciousness that knows that what it knows, um, it's a kind of a reflective activity in a sense. And it basically reminds me uh, the last chapter of uh, Hegel's phenomenology, absolute knowledge, absolute knowledge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there we see I knows itself, not by means of others, but just by mm -hmm. knowing itself. Uh, it completes its mm -hmm. self knowledge by just knowing itself. Yeah. Without mediation, and we just fall into any meetings and so on. Mm -hmm. um, given that the Kantian background you have, uh, and with Kant, we don't have that kind of immediate knowledge, but first we need to see for the conditions of knowledge. Hmm. And we are looking for, for instance, the, 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 the possibility of experience or the, the, the power of conditions of experience. And so, on. Mm -hmm. so, do you think that the self conscious, self conscious activity of 
knowing what self-consciousness knows involve the investigation on the conditions of knowledge, or is just a kind of very Hegelian sense for immediate knowledge? I think there are no conditions of knowledge. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, is, is it, I mean, um, okay. maybe like my uh, question was wrong. No, 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 no. You were not wrong. I understand the question, and, and that's my answer. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, this wasn't a rejection of the question, or uh, I mean, it's perhaps I can um, you know, elaborate a bit um, further. It's um, very standard. I mean, um, sorry. Um, Um, it's so I, I I always fall into despair over 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 Kant uh, after not not yeah quite a little bit but so it appears that Kant um, on the one hand. Um, finds himself able to provide some articulation of what is thought in the I think. Um, this is presented in the logic and then also in the transcendental logic insofar as it yet abstracts from the manner in which that which is thus laid out in this articulation is um, brought to something that is not provided uh, through this very articulation, table of categories, judgment of God. I mean, Hegel is quite right to ask, you know, how, how does this make sense on Kant's own, on Kant's own premises? Um, but he does want um, that sphere or that, as it were, area where he says that, as where the original position of the understanding he says that at that point where he himself speaks about the systematicity of philosophy he says, he says something like it's um it can't be difficult to as we're, achieve completion here because we only have to do you know what's what's provided by the understanding to itself i mean of course you know empirical knowledge is unsurveyable in there but here it's fine <laughs> um quite so, so he can provide some articulation of it, and um, but what is there in articulated is, is, is it's 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 very. I mean, you can ask it. What kind of is logic a science for for Kant? I mean, I I know what I I think is the most the deepest interpreter of Kant. Uh, or I mentioned him, Stephen Engstrom. He would say, well, it's not a science, but it's a Formal science. <laughs> uh, well, but it, uh, the point is, it's not knowledge. Uh, um, therefore, Kant himself says it's empty, but at the same time, it's articulated. And while this articulation itself reflects its needfulness, yeah, uh, because it's a, it's an articulation into forms of discursivity, yeah. So you see in this articulation already the um, um, poverty of uh, self-consciousness as so articulated. Um, it's already sort of, uh, sort of presenting itself as something that needs to be brought elsewhere. Now the source, but still, even though there is this articulation, that is in a way, the consciousness of um, of sameness. It's part. It's um, anything um, that is um, determinacy, difference, opposition, so on, is relegated to the um, form of its exercise in which it relates to um, intuition or what's given in intuition. Um, so say just very vaguely and broadly, there is um, um, negativity is excluded from the self comprehension of thought insofar as it's um, confined within its what's that's a, what's what's provided through itself, uh, and um, 
in that sense, um, knowledge has then for him conditions. You know? um, and that will always be conditions that in effect frustrated as knowledge. And I, I um, the conditions which reside in its being limited to its application to what's given in intuition according to our forms of intuition, that uh, is reflected in the impossibility of its um, refining itself as knowledge in the object. So, so the um, sorry, this this now goes into it um, an understanding of the transcendental dialectic and what its point is. I think its point in the trans um, the form of progressions in the transcendental dialectic, which are seen to be interminable, are progressions in which um, knowledge or its self understanding tries to as well complete itself through its material use. Yeah? So, in justification, for example. I seek to understand what I know to be known through its grounds. Uh, so in expanding my knowledge so as to include its grounds, I uh, seek to therein um, achieve comprehension of myself as knowing what therein I know. Um, now, I already understand myself as knowing it through experience, but this, this is something in which I, in its material employment, knowledge tries to return to itself. That return is sort of frustrated. That's the, that's the teaching of the transcendent dialectic. And this is how I understand what it means that knowledge is only knowledge of appearances. Knowledge that's knowledge of appearances is that's something that is, I think, now forgotten. I'm, this is something that frustrates me about contemporary conscience that they, that, they, that, they, that, they, that they don't feel the devastation that one must feel when one is told knowledge is only of appearances. They, they, they're so fine with it, and that just makes me, <laughs> drives me crazy. It is, to say that knowledge is knowledge of appearances is to say that it is deficient as knowledge. Yeah? Um, how is it deficient as knowledge? Um, it, it does not achieve comprehension of itself as knowledge through and in what it knows. Yeah? This is precisely what is frustrated. Uh, so the conditions on knowledge are as such, and that is the formal character as conditions on knowledge. Something like that we done. The conditions of the possibility of knowledge that are as such the conditions of its impossibility. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that, that's uh, this is this um, means there's um, and, uh, and now you can as it were rejoice in this paradox. Uh, or you can say, well, this shows that there's something in this with the very idea of conditions of knowledge. Um, and, and, this, and this has to do with the, so, so, I mean, I, I really want to um, emphasize this again, it already came up. What can I know? The, and the question is answered only in such a way if um, my understanding of what it is that I know is such as to provide for my understanding of myself as knowing it. Um, in knowing what that, or what I thus know, that is to say, in, in the the in where the fundamental idea of an object of knowledge is such as to provide through itself for the comprehension of it as known. Yeah, is it, only then can it be that in knowing what I thus know, I know myself to know it. Um, that um, is as where the original idea of knowledge and its object. I'm thinking. I call it in a certain paper. I call it naivete. Like that, that's a naive position, absolute idealism is the naive position, yeah? and the naive position which is just expressed in the very uh, idea brought to language in the in the terms I know, yeah, um, and um, this is something that um, uh, reveals knowledge to have no conditions. For I mean, if what I know through itself provides for its comprehension as does known, then there is nothing outside that what I know and my knowledge of it, by which, um, which could be a condition uh, of it. Yeah? So therefore, conditions of knowledge are as such what frustrates <laughs> the, uh, I don't know, con consummation or whatever I want to call it, of knowledge. Yeah. And this is how it is in Kant. Mm -hmm. so, it's, it's not, it's, 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 so Kant is different from 
those people who, who want to give a theory of knowledge. These are, of course, awful in a further way because they just think there's this knowledge now I'm going to say, what are the conditions in which someone knows something? This is not what Kant wants because or, that's not Kant's theme. There are conditions outside the knowledge. And for example, they say this yields then a uh, sort of difference of knowing something and knowing that one knows it. That's automatic. I mean, if there is, um, if, if there's a theory of knowledge, then, sorry, I'm repeating myself, then knowing something cannot be the same as knowing oneself to know it, because um, then there would be certain conditions under which someone knows something which would not be known in knowing what he does knows. Yeah, so um, there would be difference uh, between knowing something and knowing that the conditions are fulfilled for under which one alone one knows them. And, and so we've got this very sophisticated insights, um, level confusions in epistemology. There's this one paper where someone argues that Descartes made the crucial mistake of thinking that in order to know something, well, when or he confused knowing something and knowing that one knows it. This was Descartes' error, so in all seriousness. And from therein starts analytic epistemology. And then no, 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 that's the difference. Now, this is not what Kant does. Here we have conditions of knowledge which immediately uh, as well, make nonsense with the very idea of knowledge. But Kant doesn't do this because he asks the question, what can I know? But thereby, he is, while at the same time, thinking of there being conditions for knowledge is forced into the transcendental dialectic and the despair, I, I, I'm despair. I've had my Kant crisis. That's all right. I thought I was going to, I was searching the truth, but then this has been brought down to appearances. Now, what am I going to do? Makes no sense anymore. Yeah. I'll say it. I'll say it by the Class didn't, uh, there's no eagle around to save class. Yeah. It, it was, was this? Yeah, perfect. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Unfortunately, we've run out of time mm. and we can't take any more questions. Uh, so, uh, round of applause for Sebastian.